So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next in the series of the Viruses and Vaccines Seminar. Um, my name is Helen Chu. I'm at the University of Washington, and I am delighted today to welcome um, Keith Klugman from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as Pavitra Roy Chowdhury from the University of Washington uh, Department of Lab Medicine to come and speak to us today. So Pavitra is um, an acting instructor at the University of Washington, and her focus is on genomics, and she has will provide us a SARS-CoV-2 genomics update, and that will be followed by, uh, by Keith. Um, Keith is a professor um, of uh, pediatrics. He is um, the Emeritus Fagy Chair of Global Health at um, Emory University and is the director of the pneumonia program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So Keith has really played a, a seminal role in understanding the role of pneumococcal vaccine in protecting young children and also has done important work in sepsis and invasive um, surgical infection, both at Emory and at the university. He's also, um, a professor at the University of Waterstrand in South Africa, um, and uh, has really played a, an important role, particularly in the last three years, in providing regular briefings to the foundation and outside of the foundation on the COVID response. So um, welcome, Pavitra and Keith, um, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Pavitra. All right. Um... Thank you so much, Helen. Um, hi, everybody. I'm filling in again uh, today for Trevor to give the five minute genomics update. All right. So um, today's genomic update is focused on XBB 1.5, which has been in the news a lot in recent weeks. Um, XBB 1.5 is a sublineage of Omicron, which is currently representing the majority of sequence cases in the Northeastern United States. So um, shown here is a screen grab from the CDC's variant tracker for region one, um, where XBB is uh, thought to account for about 80% of all um, sequenced cases. Region two, which includes New York and New Jersey is also at a similar level. Um, one thing to note is that the last three, week, uh, three weeks portions and numbers um, for the CDC's estimates shown in this picture are from their nowcast algorithm, which attempts to correct for the lag that occurs between sample collection and sequencing. So the numbers uh, can change, uh, you know, in especially in the recent weeks. So across, when you look across the US, the proportion of XBB 1.5 varies quite widely. Here on the West Coast, XBB accounts, XBB 1.5 accounts for less than 10% of sequenced cases at the moment. Um, in previous waves, uh, we've seen sometimes there's a lag between the two coasts in the proportions of variants catching up. But this difference to me is quite striking. I don't think that we've seen this level of uh, a difference for any of the other variants uh, over a fairly like uh, for over several weeks. Well, the other thing to note also is that there's a little bit more noise these days in sequencing data because the overall numbers of sequenced cases is reducing. Um, so yeah, at, at, in any case, this has prompted some questions about accurate detection and counting of this particular variant. So XBB, the parental lineage of 1.5, is a recombinant lineage that was originally identified in India last year, um, in the middle of last year. Uh, it likely arose in a person who was co-infected with two different BA2 lineages, as shown in this uh, nice graphic from Emma Hotcroft. Um, it then picked up two additional mutations in spike, um, shown here at the bottom, um, uh, 252V and 486P, um, and then uh, and that is what gave rise to XBB 1.5, which was picked up in uh, New York and Connecticut. And these mutations are thought to contribute to XBB 1.5's enhanced uh, ACE2 binding and higher transmissibility. And um, the uh, what I mentioned before about counts uh, and accuracy, uh, one of the concerns is that um, some of these mutations that uh, that the virus is accumulating over time, some of them occur in primer regions in commonly used aplicon sequencing kits. And mutations in primer sites can lead to lower coverage in those regions in certain parts of the genome or cause entire aplicons to drop out due to a lack of amplification. So uh, this is NEB's primer monitor, and the blue bubbles show for each lineage of um, Omicron or um, a recombinant at the bottom here, um, the primers that could be affected in spike, that's the blue bubbles. 
Um, in our lab, we are not seeing a huge discrepancy in the numbers, and we we think that there is actually like a lower uh, percentage of XBB compared to the, it, it's not a majority of cases by any means. Um, but this is something that we are uh, monitoring over time to look at the performance of different amplicon sequencing kits uh, and how they do in um, sequencing different uh, Omicron sublineages. So what does XBB mean, uh, XBB 1.5 mean for the rest of the winter? Uh, well, case counts, as you know, are not reliable, but hospitalizations for COVID-19 seem to have peaked and the numbers are not nearly as high as they were last winter. Um, wastewater is another good metric and those concentrations in these data are courtesy Biobot. Um, those appear to have peaked in all four regions as well. Um, so overall, this seems to suggest that immunity through vaccination and recent infection might be holding up. And so we'll expect to see those numbers hopefully decline over the next few weeks. And um, that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Pavitra. Um, Pavitra, do you have a sense of uh, how well the, the bivalent booster um, is the four or five, right, is protective against, uh, against XPB? I think there was some uh, laboratory data that showed that uh, the bivalent booster was able to neutralize, of course, not at the same levels as like uh, pre-Omicron, but um, that it did provide protection um, against um, XBB 1.5, or rather, X, X, yeah, XBB 1.5. So I think we're all good. I'll just get it into, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so thanks, everybody. Apologies for uh, my computer misbehaving on Zoom. Being from the Gates Foundation, we tend to use uh, Teams and Zoom doesn't behave quite as well. But it's a great pleasure. And thanks, Helen, for inviting me. It's, uh, I feel like a bit of a local Seattle person after having lived there for eight years, but we escaped during the pandemic as many people are wont to do in their 60s to the sun in Florida. So I'm gonna to talk to you today um, about two vaccines in particular, uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, but seeing as the title was viruses and vaccines, I'm going to talk about the link between pneumococcal disease and viral disease, and then update you on the latest pneumococcal conjugate vaccine efforts. And then I'm gonna mainly focus on RSV. But to start with, I thought it'd be useful to share some data from Seattle. This is all um, data from the GBD. Um, and uh, what it illustrates uh, is the remarkable association of um, pneumonia in children with socioeconomic uh, uh, circumstance. So what we have on the left is mortality and on the right is pneumonia incidence. Um, and if you look at these gray bars on the left, they broadly are uh, African series. And what they tell you, and what we have on the x-axis is socio-demographic index. In other words, towards the right is wealthier uh, and towards the left is poorer. And we're talking about under five mortality. So this is the wealth of the parents. So you'll see in Africa that the richest families still have a huge burden of kids dying from pneumonia, but there's a logarithmic association with poverty. So the poorest country, the poorest people in Africa have by far the highest burden of mortality from pneumonia in their children. If you look at rich countries, which are the red ones here, you'll see that uh, rich folk in first world countries have almost zero mortality uh, in their kids. But there still is some mortality and the poorest people, you can just see these red lines going up a little bit, um, certainly do have kids who can die from pneumonia. But the death rate of the poorest kids in the rich world is lower than the death rate of kids who belong to the richest people in Africa. Uh, and pretty much the same patterns on the right in terms of incidence. The, the average slope you can see is less severe, so the relationship with poverty is not as great for pneumonia overall, and certainly everybody, all kids can get pneumonia. This line is not now at, at zero, um, but uh, there's an association then with incidence, but a dramatic association, logarithmic association uh, with mortality. And just 
So the adults don't feel left out of this because in a world of COVID, obviously pneumonia in adults is top of all our minds. Um, I want to show you the, these really fascinating contrasting patterns of pneumonia and mortality uh, over the past uh, few years. So uh, what you see here is a dramatic reduction from 2000 to 2019 before the pandemic. This is not COVID data. Uh, in infant pneumonia mortality, 57% uh, reduction in kids under five, 41% in the older kids, much lower incidence, obviously there you see the U-shaped curve, and then pneumonia in the elderly, um, and see how it's gone up. And this is before COVID. Obviously, COVID would dramatically have increased this. Um, but it is fascinating, and what we believe is going on here is that Many, many children's parents in particularly places like China and India escaped from absolute poverty in the last 20 years. And so uh, as much as we'd like to claim that this is all vaccines and whatever, I think the biggest driver has been reductions in, in great poverty, which as I showed you on the last slide, was hugely associated with pneumonia mortality. On the other hand, the, Keith, Keith, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, the slides don't seem to be advancing. We're oh. seeing, at least what we're seeing is still. Um, oh, the first uh, one. Okay, let, me, let me get out and uh, and reshare. Then, hold on. So we see a rise in pneumonia deaths in not older age groups, but is this adjusted for? changes in population because we have more older yeah families. so that's exactly right the the overwhelming cause of the increased mortality in the elderly is an increase in the number of people who are surviving to 60 and 70 years of age and uh, and unfortunately there again like i talked about the logarithmic association with pneumonia mortality and in poverty in young kids, there's the same association as we now know so abundantly from COVID in the elderly. And so you, you see this logarithmic association of increased pneumonia, just like you see with increased COVID uh, pneumonia in the elderly. And so the dominant explanation is indeed that, that there are more and more old people, people with underlying comorbidities who are surviving, and therefore the absolute numbers, and those are absolute numbers or rates are, are going up overall, but it has to do with more old people around. So in a way, it's a good thing, uh, but uh, we haven't yet figured out how to protect the elderly adequately from pneumonia. Okay, if I don't go to full screen mode, it seems, can you see the third slide now? We can, yeah, so you can just, Go from here and then we can um, until Robin is able okay. to the PowerPoint. So, okay, that is. Okay, go. so if you put the two together, um, then of course, Sub Saharan Africa mortality is in young kids, all in green, and adult mortality in gray is relatively modest. Whereas if you move to the right and you see North America, Virtually all mortality from pneumonia is in gray, so in the elderly. And that's just the confluence of the two things I've talked about, poverty and then older people contributing much more in rich countries because they, they, they live longer. So the last thing I wanted to say about infant mortality is that there's a huge slice of mortality. You can see on the right-hand slide, um, the right-hand part of the slide in yellow, in the first month of life. So although I've been talking up to now about infant mortality in kids under five, um, we do need to consider that more and more kids who die under the age of five are dying um, in the first year of life, first month of life. So we look at vaccines to prevent kids dying of any cause. Uh, pneumococcal disease is number one. And you might not consider malaria as a vaccine preventable disease, but of course there is a new vaccine. It hasn't rolled out much, but there's a huge preventable burden of malaria mortality. But this is my excuse to talk about the pneumococcus. And I'm going, can you guys see the slides advancing now? Good. So this is one of my favorite slides from the CDC. It's pretty old now, um, but it is my favorite slide because of the slide that's going to follow it, which I'll share with you in a minute. So this is a picture of the introduction of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in 2000. 
And if you look at that red line plummeting down, that's the reduction in disease in kids under five, and it virtually disappeared by 2007. But the most extraordinary thing about that from the same paper, and looking at the same numbers, but now looking at over 65 year olds is the same red line, which is the pneumococcal types included in the seven valent vaccine, dramatically reduced 92% down by 2007 in the elderly. And this was before any older people received pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So this was all herd protection and a dramatic herd protection. In fact, those strains virtually disappeared by 2010 when the next uh, conjugate vaccine uh, came. So I want to talk a little bit now. Uh, well, I'll come back to, to PCV itself, but this is these are data from a study which we conducted way back at the end of the uh, 1900s, early 2000, of a nine-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And you don't see pneumococcus on the slide at all. So the endpoint of the study was uh, invasive pneumococcal disease. And at the bottom, there's a statement there that says vaccine type pneumococcal bacteremia naught versus one, which looks kind of cryptic. But what that's telling you is that in this, all the patients who are on this slide, which is several hundred individuals, there was almost no bacteremia. But this is the secondary endpoint. It was the co-primary endpoint of the study was to look at pneumococcal pneumonia in any way we could define it. So we had an x-ray confirmed picture of pneumococcal pneumonia, but we also looked for viruses. And so this was pre uh, rep, uh, easy availability of PCR. Most of these done with immunohistochemistry, uh, just looking at uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. And you'll see here that if there is influenza identified in kids on the trial, there's a reduction in kids who got PCV9. So the PCV9 vaccinees are the one column and the controls are the other. So let me just take a step back because you guys don't necessarily all know what I'm talking about here. This is a trial of in excess of 30,000 children randomized individually to receive either the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, nine valent vaccine, or a no vaccine. And you'll see that there's a 45% vaccine efficacy uh, against influenza. And so these are confirmed. In other words, they have influenza, nasopharyngeal uh, evidence of influenza. They're hospitalized and they have pneumonia. And the kids who got the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine have less influenza. And you might say, well, okay, is there something in the vaccine that protects against influenza? But then you go one down and you'll see it protects against para-influenza. It protects against human metanumovirus disease, and even RSV. The RSV number is a little lower and not significant. Um, but in fact, we believe that is because the, um, the vaccine is unable to prevent, protect against RSV in the youngest kids. Uh, and many of the, because the vaccine is only given uh, at 6, 10, and 14 weeks of age, and there's a lot of RSV in the first two or three months of life. So this tells us that, in fact, pneumococcal disease follows viral infection. Um, and uh, what about the coronavirus? Well, this study was done 20 years ago, so there was no SARS-CoV-2. But we did go back and look for uh, the infant coronaviruses. And what you see on this slide is the same thing. So if you look at the highlighted bar, the middle one, you'll see that, in fact, there, if you look at all kids, there were 41 kids in the pneumococcal group who had any coronavirus. These are all hospitalized kids in the, uh, at the hospital uh, versus 62 in the uh, control group. And so there's a 33% reduction in coronavirus-associated hospitalization. And if you move along, virtually all of that is in kids who are not HIV infected. So there was a 64% reduction there and a non-significant uh, number in the HIV infected kids. But the, the take home message is what I put in the box at the bottom. And that is that the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine protected around 20% if there was any virus detected. And that's the same amount of reduction we saw in alveolar consolidation 
X-ray confirmed pneumonia. In other words, our best way of defining pneumococcal disease, all we had to do was just look at if they had a virus, then the pneumococcal vaccine worked better than pneumonia without a virus identified. So it tells us that kids who are hospitalized with pneumonia, um, and these, uh, the vaccine only protects against pneumococcal pneumonia and only actually protects about 50 to 80% against the pneumococcal pneumonia because there are vaccine serotypes that it doesn't protect against. So it, the, the inference from all of this is there is an enormous burden of, uh, of viral pneumonias, which are then uh, flow on to pneumococcal pneumonia and are preventable by the vaccine. So can you do these sorts of studies in real time, real world settings? So that was a double blind randomized trial. Now here's some data from the US looking at the rollout uh, of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, that's the PC7 in different states. And it rolled out in different states in different times. And that's on the X axis. On the Y axis is the uh, influenza hospitalization rate. And you'll see that, in fact, in every uh, year, this, these the different colors are the years the vaccine rolled out. So um, the first one here is before the vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine came. And you'll see the states that we looked at, there was no uh, association of increasing coverage because there was virtually no coverage. But here, as the vaccine started rolling out, and obviously this is the vaccine coverage went up over time, you do see this negative association uh, with influenza hospitalization in kids. So the states that had the highest uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine coverage in their kids had the lowest hospitalization for um, influenza. Uh, and if you look at RSV, this is another separate study also done in the US. If you look at the top right in the three to 11 month olds, you'll see that in fact, there is a trend which was significant to reduced RSV disease over time uh, as the pneumococcal uh, vaccine uh, rolled out over time from 2000 to 2009. Underneath that, you see pneumococcal pneumonia going down and pneumococcal septicemia going down. So, um, so there is this fascinating association of pneumococcal disease with, uh, um, with viral respiratory epidemics. Now, to finish on pneumococcus, I just wanted to say that this is the picture of the world. Um, maybe I'll tempt fate and see if we can go to a full screen picture here. Oh, okay. Um, this is a picture of the world um, in 2006. And if you see, I don't know if you can see my pointer now on full screen. Uh, you can't. I'm getting a thing. Okay, so I'll, I'll have to go back to the um oops okay we can see Maybe. your pointer now oh okay <laughs> okay i just went back here so okay i'll uh what i'll show you is the without the pointer you can see that the green countries are the rich parts of the world uh for some reason poor old new zealand at bottom right didn't have the vaccine yet but it's really been dramatic uh, look at 2022 now and you see virtually the whole world, interestingly, with one huge exception in gray there, which you see is China. And, uh, and so the inference from what I've been saying is that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine can reduce pneumonia dramatically in children, and it can also reduce viral associated pneumonias. And then through herd protection, which we also talked about, it can reduce pneumonia mortality in adults. And so the question is, will China suffer for not having immunized their kids with pneumococcal conjugate vaccine? And will the circulating flu, coronavirus, RSV, or whatever in China as well, create more problems uh, for the elderly in that country without the rollout of the conjugate vaccine? Um, so I'm gonna uh, just say one more thing now about uh, pneumococcal uh, vaccine, and that is, this is another great story, which is also a Seattle story, is that we at the Gates Foundation are funding um, a, a new biotech company called InventPrize in Seattle to make a 25-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. And it's a vaccine which is um, 
it comprises the 25 major causes of uh, invasive pneumococcal disease in children in the developing world. So while the 20 valent vaccine, which you'll see just below that is coming available, is available for adults in the United States, not yet available in kids, um, that is actually directed at adult disease in the United States. And so we are hoping to um, be able to support the development of a vaccine focused on 25 strains for kids in, in poor countries. So the last bit of my talk, I want to move to RSV. And uh, so what I'm going to move, I'll, I have one slide on flu. So we're going to talk now about maternal immunization. And so this is one slide on flu showing that if you vaccinate pregnant women, and this was a study funded by the Gates Foundation in South Africa, but there was another one done in Nepal, which in fact UW was involved with, um, and uh, showed virtually the same data that you can reduce pneumonia burden in young kids in the first 90 to 120 days of life if you vaccinate pregnant women. But uh, influenza is not a huge reason for hospitalization in very young kids, um, but RSV is. So we've just come through this RSV uh, peak in the United States. And RSV traditionally was considered to be a major burden of pneumonia, still is in kids, but kids ought not to die in big numbers if they're hospitalized. But what this slide shows is we we funded a bunch of studies around the world which show a dramatic mortality during RSV season outside of hospitals. So kids who, again, returning to where I started, kids who are poor, who are too poor for their parents to get them to the hospital, die of RSV in enormous numbers. We did these studies in kids who had died, and we got access to kids who had died and got nasopharyngeal swabs from the kids. And we found overall about 10% of kids who die between the first week of life and six months of age uh, die with RSV in their nasopharynx. And that goes up to even more than that, obviously, during uh, RSV season because RSV is so seasonal. So let me just bring you guys up to speed at the end now on where we are at with preventing RSV in kids. No licensed vaccine yet uh, and a monoclonal antibody also on its way. So the first trial of a, a vaccine for RSV was a, a vaccine made by a company called Novavax. We funded 50% of that trial. Uh, and unfortunately, you're not using that vaccine, even though you can see this is a paper from the NEJM three years ago, because it was only sort of middle effective. If you look at the middle line there, vaccine efficacy, you'll see in the middle, was just under 40% protective with the 95% confidence interval, it was above zero, but in fact, for the FDA, the trial had to use a more stringent confidence interval because they had uh, done an interim analysis and it was actually missed significance. Um, but uh, the news is good. So because subsequent to that, we now have a monoclonal antibody and these are the data uh, showing better effectiveness uh, up to 70, 80% protectiveness, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, against medically attended uh, low respiratory tract infection. And on the right, some evidence that in fact, uh, it also protects against all-cause pneumonia. Now this is very cool, but likely to be unaffordable in poor countries. So the monoclonal is something that will be great for the US, not necessarily uh, as useful in poor countries. And there is now a next generation vaccine. So Pfizer have made a maternal RSV vaccine. This is the phase 2B data, uh, which have been published uh, and show dramatically 80 to 90% reduction in severe low respiratory tract infections. Now I very rarely show from companies themselves but because this only exists at the moment in a press release, this is the latest data on the phase three data uh, from the Pfizer study. Uh, and similarly, they're showing around 80% reduction in the first 90 days of life. So this is pregnant women getting one shot of the vaccine and then following up the infants and an 80% reduction 
in a severe medically attended low respiratory tract infection. The primary endpoint of all medically attended low respiratory tract infection, about 57% protection. So because I want to leave time for questions, I'm going to just briefly go over some of our thoughts for the future. Now, the, these vaccines are just proteins given to pregnant women. And the world has changed in the last three years in many ways, as you know. But one of those ways is that millions of pregnant women have received mRNA. And there's no reason why you can't make an RSV mRNA vaccine. And so this is what we're funding at the moment, looking at next generation mRNA vaccines, uh, hopefully to be given to pregnant women. Uh, and they may be even more potent, uh, perhaps as we've seen with COVID. Uh, and if that is the case, then hopefully even better uh, protection of their infants uh, when moms are immunized with, uh, uh, with a future mRNA RSV vaccine. So in summary then, deaths are declining in children, I showed you, but pneumonia, major problem in both children and adults and actually going up in adults. Uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine has rolled out in many countries, but there's still residual disease. And I talked a bit about the next generation vaccine we're quite excited about. I showed you how PCVs associated with reductions in RSV and flu hospitalizations in children and even COVID hospitalizations, but that was the, the circulating uh, coronaviruses in kids. We have not uh, seen impact um, on this pandemic. Uh, more than 45% of childhood deaths occur in neonates, which is the intro to the RSV story. Um, and we've got the first proof of concept now, of maternal immunization, an RSV vaccine, and uh, a single dose of monoclonal antibody. Um, and then our optimism, perhaps, that an mRNA RS vaccine or any RSV vaccine may significantly impact uh, pneumonia mortality. And finally, I apologize for my problems with Zoom. So I'll go back to Helen. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. That was really amazing to see. I, I remember reading about the pneumococcal uh, viral interaction data in your Nature Medicine paper many years ago. So, um, and it really sort of comes to the forefront again with this past season. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and start with the one from Sarah Vora. So, um, her question is: In countries where um, where it is available, would the strategy be both maternal vaccine and MAB for all babies after six months or only in high-risk babies? And I think this is referring to nirsevimab um, and potentially the, the Pfizer. Um, yeah, so really good question. And I don't, you know, people haven't figured this out yet. There's probably going to be a bit of a bun fight between the manufacturers. Um, I think that realistically the hope would be that if uh if mom has received the vaccine, that you wouldn't need to give a vaccine to or monoclonal to the infant, except in certain circumstances. And that would be, uh, obviously, if mom, uh, if baby's born very premature, and maybe just a week or two after the vaccine was given, uh, then you may want to still cover uh, with the monoclonal. Um, and then obviously, a maternal immunization, we have never been able to get more than 50% of pregnant women to take vaccines. So unless that gets up, there'll still be a significant number of kids in RSV season who are unprotected and therefore the monoclonal will be a, a kind of backup strategy uh, for them. In poor countries, I suspect uh, that it's gonna be mainly the vaccine, but what I didn't mention is we're actually also working on next generation monoclonals. Mm -hmm. And if we can find monoclonals, where we at the Gates Foundation have a controlling interest uh, in the product, we may be able to make them cheap enough that uh, it may also be available in uh, in poor countries. So, so I do see a dual story there, but this is all for the first six months of life. Um, babies get bigger, so you would need bigger doses of the monoclonal if you wanted to continue to protect them. Um, and I think that in fact, there's more and more interest now in the possibility uh, of follow-up vaccination, maybe with mRNA from six months of age. Um, and that would be fascinating if it is actually the case that you can interrupt uh, RSV transmission, which of course we haven't been too great at with COVID, but you know, in all fairness, I blame the virus there for mutating 
so much away from the vaccine. And with RSV, we don't expect that degree of mutation. So there may in fact well be um, an impact on, on all disease or all transmission. And that would be huge. If we can stop RSV transmission in kids, I would suspect that it'll also have a major impact on RSV in adults. So that is all the next sort of stage um, beyond six months of age, because it's unlikely to be the very young infants who are the main transmitters. It'll be the older infants who are not hospitalized as much, but likely to be the, the key transmitters. Thanks, Keith. The other point is that there will also be an RSV vaccine uh, potentially for older adults, um, that there's um, several that are in the pipeline um, that should be uh, going forward for licensure uh, soon, and that's intended for age 60 plus. So there's a possibility that there will be simultaneous rollout of an infant product as well as an older adult product. So it might be harder to look at the effect of um, of pediatric vaccine on a reduction in RSV disease if those do come simultaneously. So. Right, I agree. Um, I just, okay. Oh, go ahead. No, I just saw, one, uh, you, you might have other questions. I just saw one flash in front of about, is there a risk of uh, of escape with the monoclonals? And absolutely, and, and ideally, you would want a monoclonal, uh, at least two monoclonals, in fact. Uh, but that all comes down to a cost question. But, uh, and, and as I said, the the opportunity for RSV to escape seems to be somewhat less than what we're seeing with the coronavirus, but there has been already uh, one monoclonal out there which uh, the trial failed because of vaccine esca escape mutants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, I think, a, a two part question, one from Cecile and then another, and then also from Lauren, really around this idea of the of the bidirectional interaction between um, respiratory viruses and, and bacteria. Um, and so the question from Cecile is, you have nicely shown how pneumococcal vaccine reduces RSV outcomes and is the interaction bidirectional, so should we expect RSV interventions to cut down on residual pneumococcal outcomes? Yeah, and so this kills me to say as a pneumococcal person, but it may well be true that uh, pneumococcal disease, I would expect to dramatically reduce if we have a successful RSV vaccine, certainly in the very early kids. And then, you know, the age groups are a little different. So you would need that follow on vaccination to protect the older kids. But yeah, I, I do anticipate that uh, interventions against RSV are going to reduce pneumococcal disease burden. Um, and then uh, another question from Lauren about uh, maternal vaccination and protection by a breast milk antibody. Yeah, so that's interesting. We haven't really seen a lot of evidence uh, for this. Of course, the breast milk antibody, you know, is mucosal and uh, and the, um, you know, not a hell of a lot is going to get into the lungs of the infants, um, but uh, it may play some role. But uh, so far, we've not really been able to nail that down. Um, uh, so most of the protection uh, is likely just to be from uh, direct protection um, uh, with antibody transfer. Of course, there's a second mechanism, and that is who who gives RSV to the baby? And of course, mom could be implicated in that. So if mom is immune, then that would reduce at least one uh, source of, of infection. But like pertussis, the best way to protect is to vaccinate mom and have mom with high levels of antibody at birth. Um, I was going to ask you a question about uh, the the role of MABs in preterms and, and then HIV exposed unaffected. Yeah. And whether or not um, that is something that the that the foundation is working on um, in terms of sort of developing a strategy, because in, in those populations, maternal vaccination may not be as effective. Yeah. So that is exactly the the reason that we are trying to uh, to come up with either a similarly potent monoclonal to nisivimab. Uh, that will be more affordable, um, or we are actually looking at whether we can find more potent uh, monoclonals with this idea that fits in with one of the questions earlier. You know, could we even come up with a two monoclonal strategy? Um, but certainly nisivimab has been tested uh, in premium infants, and that was the first studies. 
and uh, it's very likely and it has been shown to work so just like palibizumab did so or better so uh, so yes that certainly will remain a a consideration and as in the future more and more i think of the burden of disease is going to be concentrated in uh, in prem infants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um lauren had another question um which is about how new, that pcv could be protecting from flu infection does bacterial pneumonia create higher risk for flu infection and um I guess. So we actually think it's the other way around. So pretty, you know, they, they, again, you could argue, but in animal studies anyway, it's not as obvious that it works the other way around. So we think it's primarily that kids, well, everybody is, many, many people are exposed to respiratory viral infections, and then a small fraction of them that happen to be colonized with the pneumococcus or recently acquire a pneumococcal colonization. Um, it then uh, distracts the immune system, uh, the virus does, and allows the pneumococcus to invade. And there's a bunch of uh, mechanisms that are proposed for that, but we think that's the that's the way it goes. And if you look at the timing of pneumococcal pneumonias in relation to, say, flu epidemics, there's generally a two to three week lag. So we think it is viral first and bacterial second. All right, any other questions? We are coming to the top of the hour. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up then. So thank you so much, Pravitra and Keith, for pre presenting today. This was really um, a great session um, and we'll be sure to have slides ahead of time for the next one. Um, so uh, next month we'll be having um, a talk from Neil King from the Institute for Protein Design about development of vaccines. Um, uh, and I, I expect he'll be talking about the RSG vaccine candidate as well. So really exciting um, to hear about that and um, look forward to seeing everybody next month. So happy Tuesday. <laughs>